Well, last week we were talking about our new name. Uh, some people don't even know that we had an old name, but we were talking about our new name, Airborne, and I want to pick up on that and do part two of that this, this week. It was on December 18th, 2016, when our name changed from the living room to Airborne, and we talked about uh, why that was last week, and if you want to watch that, it's on uh, social media, YouTube. You can watch it on our website, our app. But I want to keep going on that word airborne because I, I did an in-depth study on the word air, and I found so much, so much that God has to speak through that word air in airborne, but both of the words put together and the great meaning that it has. God's purpose behind a new name is to reveal vision to an expanded destiny. Now, several names were changed in the Bible. God had a habit of doing that. Jesus did it. We have Abram to Abraham, Simon to Peter, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel. And that's just to name a few. When I began to do um, a word study on air in airborne, and I said, there's got to be more in that word air. Now, I knew what born meant. We all know what born means. And we all, we all think we know what air means. But there's so much more to it than just air and born when you put them together and you bring the revelation of the word of God into it. The word air in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word ruach, meaning air in motion or breath that gives life. 389 times in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we have the word air again, and it's given to us in the Greek, because the New Testament was written in the Greek, Old Testament written in the Hebrew. So we have the word pneuma in the New Testament, <clears throat> which means breath, air in motion, or spirit. See, it's, it expands in the New Testament. Spirit of life, 385 times we see it in the New Testament. Look at the creation of man. When Adam came to life, you will see the first moving of the spirit in a man's life. Genesis 2 and verse 7, then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and he breathed the breath, which was ruach, of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. When did he become a living person? When God breathed on him. When the ruach of God breathed on him. It's God's air. When it came into his lungs, he became a living man. In the New Testament, in John chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, Jesus says, so don't be dis, uh, surprised when I say, he's talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus is asking him about salvation and how do I become born again. So Jesus says, so don't be surprised when I say, you must be born Again, the wind blows wherever it wants. Now, don't be confused by what he's saying there. He's saying you must be born again. He's talking about pneuma because he goes right into it in verse number eight, the wind or the pneuma or the spirit of life. You cannot be born again until you are pneuma born. Until you recognize and know that the air in the atmosphere is so much more than air. It is actually the breath of God. And when you recognize that you are alive because of the breath of God and because he always intended for you to have eternal life and you accept Jesus into your life, now because you become a believer and you know that the air is much more than just the atmosphere, that this has been God's plan all along. 
that you have eternal life. And now you are breathing the breath of God. He says the wind blows wherever it wants. In other words, God is always moving by his spirit across the earth. And God will save all those who call upon his son's name, Jesus. So Jesus was saying, you must be pneuma born or you must be airborne. Born of the breath that gives life. Airborne is a message of salvation. And the next time that you end up hearing somebody ask you, why do you call it airborne? Tell them that it's the meaning of life. If you can believe the air you breathe comes from a living God that always intended for you to have eternal life, you can be airborne. The plan of salvation was spoken of in the very beginning of the Bible. In the first three verses, Genesis 1 and verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God, listen to this, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And the Spirit of God, or the breath of God, or the breath that gives life was hovering over the waters. This is before, this is before creation, okay? The wind of the Spirit was blowing all the way from the first three verses of the Bible, and the Spirit of God hovered, or the love of God hovered, or the love of God would be manifested through his Son, Jesus, and hover over the earth. I can tell you that the Spirit of God still today is hovering over all of the earth. Now, just to help you understand what is happening here at the beginning of creation, because there's so much going on, because we see the plan of salvation being acted out in the first three verses of the Bible. So God sends out Jesus to hover, Jesus being the love of God, the manifested one that will come to us, that will come to earth to make known the love of the Father. So God sends Jesus out to hover over the waters and over the earth. The word hovered in the Hebrew meaning means to be fluttered, uh, fluttered lovingly. Now the word for hovered in Aramaic and Hebrew is in the feminine form. It's the relational side of God. There's an authority side of God, okay? There's a yes and amen side of God. But make no mistake about God. He's, he's not just a, a God that brings justice upon the earth and brings justice into our lives. Thank God we who are born again, the justice comes to us through Jesus Christ and frees us of our sin. But there is a relational side of God. So in these first three verses of the Bible, we are seeing the feminine side, the relational side of God as he is looking across the waters. As he is looking across the earth, he is looking into time. And he is, he is showing us how much he already loves what he is about to create. It's the relational side of God. Or as a mother would watch over her children. It means the highest level of love and affection hovered. 
The same word hovered is used in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 11. And we get a little more definition here where it says like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. The scene that is created here in the first three verses of Genesis is as a mother sending out her son to see all of creation upon which her son will die. Genesis 1 through 3, it's a whole plan of salvation. God looks out. God looks ahead. He sees the emptiness. He sees the darkness. But he knows that his greatest creation is coming. And that man and women alike will end up failing. They'll end up sinning and they'll fall out of relationship with God. And the relational side of God is talking to Jesus, the manifestation of God that will come to the earth. And he's saying, we have to have a plan. So I want you to go and I want you to look as I am looking. And I want you to hover over the waters of the earth. And I want you to see what is going to be my greatest creation. And I want you to know, son, that the only way to save them is that you, my son, will have to die in their place to free them of their sin. The whole plan of salvation is happening in the first three verses of Genesis and creation hasn't even come yet. Now Paul, he reflects on this moment in Ephesians 1 and 4 through 5. Long ago, even before he made the world, okay? You see how that connection is? All the way back to the beginning, Ephesians 1, 4 through 5, long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. Here's the conversation that is going on before creation. Jesus the Son of God, God himself, the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. They're all having a conversation and this is the conversation that they're having in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 that we find Paul referring back to before the foundations of the earth. And so long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. He decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. And we who stand before him covered with his love, remember hovering, the relational side of God, hovering over the earth, covered with his love, his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. And he did this because he wanted to. At the time of creation, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, darkness is over the earth and God makes his plan lovingly, hovering, over the earth through his son Jesus, giving him the plan that one day he would have to die for our sins. He said, I'm gonna create man and woman, but they are gonna fall and they're gonna fall into darkness. But then my son is gonna be lifted up on the cross, arms open wide, saying to the earth, how much he loves them, that I hang here, that I hover here, 
just as the Father told me before the foundations of the earth that I would die on this cross in your place so that you might have the breath, the air of God that gives life and not only life, but eternal life. So Jesus was lifted up. He hovered over the earth so that all men and women could be drawn unto him. So the plan for this breath of life was to save us through the sacrifice of the son, Jesus. I've said all that to pile up a mountain of evidence to tell you that God loved you long before your beginning. The same life-giving air that was in motion at, at creation is moving in this place today. Let me tell you, when the breath of God begins to blow into your life, it will accelerate things in your life that you just thought couldn't happen. I, I don't know what pain you might be feeling today, difficulty you might be going through today. But the more you think of it and the lack of trust that you have in God, the longer it will last. The more you trust in God, the breath of God begins to breathe in you. It begins to blow on you and it accelerates you and moves you at a faster pace past the pain that you find so difficult to bear. It's always God's purpose to get us through. It's never God's purpose to say, well, there you go. You messed it up. Why don't you just hang out there for a while? I know we do that with our kids. We lock them in bedrooms and down the cellar and stuff like that. And we tell them, you don't do that? We should sit down and talk about parenting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Not really. But the things that we go through in life, God never intends to prolong it. His purpose is by the wind of the Spirit to blow life into us. Last year I was... I was going out to um, St. Louis, Missouri. And I was going out in my plane. My plane does about 200 miles an hour, but the, but the wind was against me. I complained the whole way. Number one, I couldn't make it all the way. I had to land, I had to get gas, and the wind was still blowing. I was only doing 140 miles an hour. Had a 60 mile an hour headwind. I tried all kinds of altitudes. It just, it just didn't work. I complained, I complained, I complained. It took me, it felt like it took me all day to get there. But when I got done the job and I got in the plane and I'm on my way back, I got up to about 3,000 feet, and I said, whoa, I looked at the, looked at the airspeed on the, on the GPS, the ground speed, and the ground speed was already 180 miles an hour, and I was still climbing. I climbed to 5,000 feet, and it went to 200 miles an hour. I climbed to 7,000 feet, and it went to 220 miles an hour. How many want to guess what I did? I kept climbing. I kept climbing. I climbed up to 9,000 feet. I got to 225 miles per hour. I got to 11,000, just over 11,000 feet, which is legally as high as I can go in that airplane. And I was doing 235 miles per hour. You think I was complaining? Uh-uh. I was, I felt like I was moving at the speed of the jet that Adam Sanders flies, my next door neighbor, because he's always doing 300 miles an hour. But I was getting closer. I'm going to tell you, if you can fight the wind of this world, the situations, the difficulties, the problems that we go through, if you can fight it, and you can trust God, and you can catch his wind, and you can catch his breath 
and you can trust in him and keep your eyes off the winds that wants to blow you the wrong way and slow you down and create difficulty and create pain and create heartache and create discouragement and put you in ditches of life that you feel like you can't go out, get out of. If you can just turn and begin to focus on the wind of God, the breath of God that always wants to blow you in the right direction and accelerate your pace, I'm telling you, God will bring you into a new season of life that much faster. I know that God has given me a word of prophecy today. I was writing it down this morning. And I just want to say to individuals, Jesus wants to lift you up out of your past. He wants to lift you up out of the darkness that you have been in. He wants to give you a new destiny and a new name. He wants to give you a new destiny and a new name. He can remove that darkness. He can remove that pain. He can bring you to a place where he, you are in the light, the light of God and the breath of God. You can feel his life blowing through your body. I also want to prophesy to our church family because it is an accelerated season of growth that is coming our way. Can I say that again? There's an accelerated season of growth that is coming our way. Our hearts are being prepared for harvest. There's a spirit of expectation that is in the air even today that we are breathing. A flood of people is coming. We are getting ready to walk in one of God's great seasons for our church. Oh, God is getting ready to breathe on this place. And that's why on October 1st, is that a Sunday? October 1st, first Sunday in October, we're going to be going not back to two services, we're going forward to a brand new two services, 9.30 and 11 o'clock. I'm gonna tell you, you watch us. We're preparing our teams. We're getting ready. Our teams are getting excited about it. We're just, we're gonna do it in a fresh, new way. I'm so excited about it. Things are gonna be so in order. Did you know that this, when the spirit moves, things are in order? You get things in order and you'll bring a lot more of the breath of God onto it. Oh, God is breathing in this place today. God is breathing into your life. He's breathing into the life of this church and the wind of God's spirit is blowing us into a new era.